Hey Samsung, how's it going? Found a water bear. Hey Duke Hex. I'm glad everybody's doing well. Actually got a little bit of a allergies or a cold or something. It's really minor. But it's given me a little bit of extra gravel in my voice today. Um, right in the middle of the screen here is a large, very large, sort of reddish brown colored water bear. And I have it on dark field, um, just because it's kind of a cool view. Repositioning, so I have to kind of refocus. You see, he's got uh, coming out of his little mouth a little star shaped, um, tiny little star shaped app appendages. Uh, you just barely see them here, but um, let me try and zoom in a bit. into this little zone right here. And I'm gonna... There we go. A nice tight view. You can see that uh, little thing on the front of its mouth and the claws. Uh, is it a slide or a petri dish? This is actually just a, a, a slide without a cover slip. So, roughly the same thing, I suppose, as a petri dish, but... Um, petri slide, yeah, pretty much. Um, I do this when I have a lot of lichen on my slides, because they're really bulky. And, um, you know, they cause the cover slip to sort of sit unevenly on the slide. And um, just to avoid that issue, I leave the cover slips off entirely. Um, yeah, well, it did look cool until it crawled around to the other side of the um, material here. We'll come back to it. Um, there's some other water bears in this sample that I've seen. Um, this little guy here is a rotifer. It's a little deloid rotifer. Um, are you nearly guaranteed to find one in moss? I'm curious how hard I have to look to find one. Um, I never find them in mosses. Um, I mean, literally... Every time I come across a moss, I go looking for water bears in it. I take a little sample and I bring it home. I've looked at mosses that were next to lakes, mosses that were underwater, mosses that were on rocks, mosses at the base of trees. I just, I never found a water bear in moss. Um, so I don't know. I would say my success rate with that is very low. Um, where my success rate is very high, where I've always found them, is growing or living on sticks. And um, in particular, sticks that have lichen and um, that have fallen off of the tree. They're so old, like the stick is rotted and the lichen colony is huge. That usually leads me to find water bears pretty frequently. And that's in fact what this sample is from. Uh, this is just a stick that fell off a large uh, bur oak tree in my front yard and it looks like maybe a rotifer that hasn't uh, rehydrated or maybe it's dead it could still just be sleeping and you can see a little bit of the mastex in there um, see uh, some ciliates in here as well, really small in the background, uh, kind of cruising around, and um, nematode worms, and that's pretty much the normal uh, 
group of things that we find uh, every time I go digging around in a, um, a lichen sample. It's deloid rotifers, um, these bigger red colored water bears are pretty common here, and um, uh, sometimes they get the little kind that are reddish brown. These are, I think these are called armored, uh, they have sort of armored plates on their body, and it has a sort of red color to it. Hey, like delicious. how's it going? Found a water bear relatively easily. Um, so for this sample, this is actually the first. Uh, music's just a little loud. Sorry. Oops. I need to turn it off entirely. Um, this is actually the first sample that I uh, looked at tonight. Um, it's just a piece of a stick um, that I scraped the lichen from. And then uh, this water bear is not the only one that I've seen in this sample either. I found a couple. So, um, not sure what's going on with it. It's kind of just digging around, looking for food, I guess. Um, it's a pretty normal group of critters, basically, that we find in this type of sample. Um, let me see my help. Sorry. I realize you guys are super zoomed in. Hey, Arnicky, how's it going? Uh, is the sample suspended in water or something? Yeah, jiggly. Um, I don't have a good way of showcasing that, but I can turn the camera here. Um, so what you see is there's the slide and there's just water on the surface basically of the slide. I didn't put a cover slip on it, so it's just like a piece of glass um, that we're looking at. And um, I just use plain microscope glass like this. Uh, it's really hard to see, but it's just a plain, plain microscope glass. And then uh, for this type of sample, um, I just take a little, uh, this is a transfer pipette, little plastic transfer pipette, and I cut the tip of it off so that I could fit some bigger pieces of lichen into it. And then uh, I just have a little plastic bowl that I um, shaved the lichen into. And um, when I go to uh, take a sample, I just sort of um, pull it up into the transfer pipette and then I let it settle to the bottom and then I just squeeze some of that into the slide onto the surface of it. So I'm doing well, Anarchy. Um, I just have a slight cold, I guess. Let's see if I can give you a shout out. You should check out Anarchy Kitchen. Streams from his kitchen, obviously. Uh, cooks up some great meals and then eats them in front of us uh, as punishment for watching him. And sometimes he does little photo shoots of uh, his food, builds a menu and stuff. It's very cool. Yeah, um, uh, like, yeah, I don't have a cover slip on it, but I do have cover slips here. Um, my cover glass is, you know, just little 22 by 22 uh, number one cover slips. But, um, I'm not using them for these samples just because there's uh, um, the lichen are kind of bulky and uh, they would make the cover slip kind of sit in there unevenly. Um, it actually gives a little bit better optics when you do that with the cover slip on. Um, so normally I would do that if I were um, trying to um, manage a sample that was a little bit uh, less bulky. Here's a little rotifer, another little deloid rotifer, kind of crawling along here. It's a little overexposed. And particularly to bring their brain to the table. So that uh, they're aware of what they're doing. The dark field's kind of uneven sometimes. 
Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily that I'm a pro. Uh, it's just a, um, I don't, sometimes it makes a mess of my microscope actually because the water will spill off of there. My desk is just a little uneven, so there's a slight grade to it. Um, and as a result, uh, we do sometimes get water rolling off one end of the slide. Where if I had a cover slip, it wouldn't do that. But, uh, oops. Just sometimes I make that decision and sort of stick with it, so. I don't have a lot of patience for people who feel like they're down. See if I can zoom us in a little and get this guy to stop crawling around. You know, just let, that's sometimes how they'll out. clamp onto something and okay, great. Now let's make it stick there for a while. But, uh, you know, just writing from a place of understanding rather than from a place of fear. a little deloid rotifer on one end. He has a foot so with three little claws. And, it comes along. and you don't uh, change it because you don't on the other end, he's got basically a mouth hole uh, with little corona, a cilia wrapped around it. And you can see he's attached by the foot right there. And then his head's it's out searching for ideas, food. It's about how you support the ideas. And uh, in Darkfield, oh, there's a huge raid coming in. Esten, hello. I was watching a little bit of your stream earlier, I think. Uh, Esten, you had some uh, some sort of a keyboard microchip or something on a microscope. Um, thanks for the raid. Um, anybody who has a microscope um, usually draws my attention on Twitch. And... Um, I think you were soldering something on it, which I thought was really interesting to see. Um, we've got a, a rotifer here in the foreground, and then in the background down here, uh, another rotifer. And uh, under this blob, another rotifer. Um, Hey, two chooks, how's it going? So we're just doing a little bit of uh, relaxing microscope streaming. Custom design mechanical keyboard, yeah. I maybe watched for about 10 minutes and then uh, your your crowd speaks in a language I don't understand. Um, you know, it was a bunch of very technical stuff, but uh, I suppose if I start talking about biological things, it'd probably feel the same way here. We do, we do need more microscopes on Twitch. Uh, in fact, um, I have a whole list of people who do biologically based microscope stuff on Twitch. It's this command. There's a whole crowd of them, um, all doing a little bit, right, uh, of different things. Um, my normal sort of Streaming teammate uh, Pacific Plankton is probably going to show up here in a little bit. Uh, was asking me if I was going to stream tonight. There's the water bear. You can see his little head. His body's underneath the lichen. And because we're in the dark field mode uh, on my microscope, um, you can see the, the background's very dark. Um, <laughs> Don't solder the water bears. I'm just gonna uh, tell you right now, uh, Jiggly, I don't know how to solder. Uh, my dad taught me a lot of things. I can fix a car, I can, uh, I can do a lot of really cool things, but I could never figure out how to solder for the life of me. Uh, and it seems like it should be easy. Uh, we have one of those like uh, little screwdriver like things that just you plug in and then it heats up and you think, ah, this will be easy. Uh, but I can never make it work right. So uh, there's this sort of art to it that I don't get. And, uh, you know, can't be good at everything, I guess. Hey, Pandemic, how's it going? Um, we're, we've got a water bear already. We zoomed in on it right here. Um, crawling around in the screen. I can actually get a little closer, but I'm kind of waiting for it to come out of the... Uh, it's hiding behind the lichen right here. There you can see its head. And this one has little eyes. You can see the eyes looking at us right there. They were red. 
Um, not all water bears have eyes. So, um, and this one also has sort of like a, a little five pointed star like uh, thing around its mouth. I can't remember what the name of it is uh, that they use. Um, yeah, we got a water bear. Uh, this is a. Good uh, news, everyone! Oh, thank you for the follow. Sorry, I probably blasted people out with that. Uh, normally, I jump when uh, when that happens. So, uh, let's see if I put this in DIC. What happens? So, this is the bright field view. It's a little dark because my camera settings, but let me switch it over to DIC. And um, I've got to put in the DIC and turn up the brightness a bit. And let's see if I can fix this contrast a bit too. so you can get the relief and then we can zoom in on good that. news everyone hey wave guy thank you for the follow uh, there you go that's the DIC version so we were just in uh, in dark field and uh, the difference between DIC and dark field you can see a lot more detail um, and in dark field what happens when there's a little nematode sort of photobombing our water bear um, in dark field, what happens is the light comes in at an oblique angle and um, it lowers the total amount of light coming in. Um, so tonight I'm looking at some stuff from uh, just a stick for people who came in late. Uh, hang on, I'll grab one first. Uh, for show here. Let's get this guy to sort of sit still in their, in their field of view. So normally I just find a stick like this. It's got some lichen on it. You can see the sort of light patches in here. And, um, and I just take a, a paring knife from the kitchen and I sort of scrape um, like vertically along the stick and shave it into a bowl and then I put some water in it and uh, and then wait and uh, the creatures that are in here basically were completely dehydrated uh, when we started and over the span of maybe five or ten minutes the um, they'll sort of rehydrate and come back to life uh, they weren't really dead they were in a cryptobiotic state and uh, where they just basically become completely dehydrated. And uh, looks like the water bears moved up to the top here. And that's basically the entire process. Um, <laughs> it's, a, yeah, it's a little bit like suspended animation. Um, we don't usually consider it to be a type of hibernation because in hibernation, it's usually higher organisms that uh, you know lower their body temperature and decrease their heart rate and things like that. Um, but it's kind of like being in a suspended suspended animation state. So um, they get dehydrated and they can live through that sort of dehydration or desiccation. And um, when they become rehydrated, they basically just come right back to life. That's their, you know, their life cycle basically it includes a, a component of it where they're completely dehydrated like that. So, uh, will the light blind them? Probably not. Um, I imagine it's kind of, <laughs> you saw a $60 stick for sale on Amazon. Uh, I don't think the microscope light is blinding to them. Um, the, uh, they are light sensitive. They are phototactic on some level. Um, these ones do have uh, eyes, um, but they just basically um, detect where the light is. So yeah, um, it's probably more heat related because this uh, the light does heat up the slide a little bit. 
um, although I would actually argue the water bears aren't going to be bothered by the sort of temperatures that are on typical microscope slide. Um, but it will, um, I'm sure it's quite bright for them, but it's probably comparable to sunlight um, or less. So I'm sure they've lived through worse. Um, there's a rotifer in the center of the field of view and a nematode that's not moving very much over here. Uh, and then our water bear is sort of haplessly scrambling around on this piece of lichen trying to get to the next one. Um, hang on a second before I answer that question. I don't see if I missed anything. Um, hello, Zwei. Hopefully you're doing well. Um, I'm not in my Dr. Mo guys right now. Just plain old Dr. Stone. But, uh... Good news, everyone! Thank you for the follow. Um... Well, Ray, what were they selling the stick for $60 for? Because it had a lichen on it or something? Or was it like a special stick? Um, intense macro action. Yeah. Uh, I, I do that sometimes. Um, is my microscope LED illuminated? Yes, it is. So um, you can't see that because I'm pointed too high. But the light source is down here. And um, it is an LED light source. Um, which is really the way that most of the microscopes have gone. Um, I do have a microscope in the lab that we bought that had an uh, incandescent light bulb, a tungsten filament light bulb, um, when we first got it. And we subsequently converted it to LED. Um, just because the LED light sources last a lot longer, and um, I was always switching out the little bulbs, so... I sound a little sick. Yeah, my throat's just a little gravelly. I've got a, I've had a slight either allergies or a cold. I think it's probably a cold because Sylvia had one uh, a few days ago and was recovering from it. And I don't normally get sick, but um, you know, a little sniffles and uh, gravelly sounding voice is um, about as rough as my, when I get sick, it's about as much as it is. So, a little guy looks stuck. Um, yeah, well, water bears, they, um, they spend their whole lives kind of groping around and in, uh, in confusion, I suspect. Um, so that's normal for them. <laughs> a stick with a moth in it. Okay. Uh, just like one stick with a moth on it. That sounds like uh, it's probably not worth the money. Um, associated with it, but I mean, maybe if it's a spectacular stick, I guess. Let's see. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. One of the problems with not having a cover slip on is that um, the space is very, has a lot of depth to it, and so the water bear can move around a lot more freely, and as well as rotifers and other things, and that means I have to constantly adjust the focal height a little bit more um, or I might not have to do that if I were uh, with a cover slip quite as much yeah you can see the little newt newt his little newt newt's got uh, like five little spines sticking out of it yeah he's on lichen yeah I don't think there's any moss in the sample I think it's just lichen Let's come out the other side here. Uh, that reminded me of when Google was developing a modular phone and tried to put tiny tardigrade aquarium in it. <laughs> the light ended up frying the little guys. I can't believe they would do that. Uh, you know, um, they only live for like a month like actively, right, or something like that, less than a year. So um, unless you could pull it out and replace it regularly, I don't think that's a great idea because my phone's probably going to have a much longer lifespan than a year. Um, but yeah, your phone gets a lot hotter probably than a microscope even does. And the light associated with it is probably really bright. 
I'm not sure you could see much in a phone anyway. That sounds crazy. Um, is there any advantages using different colored light, red or green illumination? Um, on, on my uh, other microscope, we have a green filter and um, uh, a neutral density filter that we used, um, but that was when we were using the incandescent light source and it's a lot harder to regulate that kind of light. Um, with the LED light, um, you get really, you know, consistent color and, um, and brightness. And so you don't need any extra filters, basically. You don't need to add like a blue light or a green light to it. Um, if you're using a microscope that has incandescent lighting, you probably want uh, I think usually they use a green green filter um, to try to get the color a little bit more adjusted. Um, I mean, if I want to make color adjustments, I'd probably do it um, uh, with the contrast tool on my uh, microscope. Um, or uh, on my camera. So, I mean, that's probably where I would focus most of my color adjustments. Um, for streaming anyway, uh, or for taking pictures, um, I might just do it afterwards, just color, color adapt it with the, uh, Photoshop or something. Mr. Guy with Face TV, hello from Los Angeles. How are you doing? We are looking at some, uh, lichen material, and this here is a water bear. Um, you can tell because they have eight legs, and, um, the back two legs are just sort of used for grasping. And the six front legs are the ones that it's sort of crawling with. And then you can see it's got like a star-shaped um, little um, thing around its mouth. Also, if you look very closely right in this view, you can see um, coming off of its head two little um, pokey-like things sticking out, um, which are probably eyes or um, some sort of sensory component. Um, on a sort of like a stalk, you can see them right there. Um, there's just one of them in view at any given time because they're kind of moving around a lot. <sighs> hey, little Chook, how are you doing? Hopefully you're doing well. Look, I got a water bear, uh, as I usually do when I'm doing night streaming. Um, we're looking at living organisms instead of dead stuff. Um, most of the time, although I can sometimes put that stuff in. And, uh... Yeah, we started off with the water bear. Uh, the hunt was successful from the get-go, basically. <laughs> Larval form? I don't think so. Uh... There's some more water bears in the sample that I know of. Um, this one's just a really big one. And uh, it's um, clumsily found its way into the open finally. Uh, so well, now it's found something else to crawl on. So it's just trying to make things challenging for me. Uh, and I'm zoomed in a little close on it, so. <laughs> Feed it. Well, um, uh, it's probably going to feed itself. There's lots of food available for it in the sample, um, in the form of bits of lichen and moss. Good news, algae, everyone! Uh, rather. Uh, which is probably what they eat. Um, although I have seen one, um, uh, trying to consume, a uh, nematode before. Good news, everyone! So. Uh, this is awesome. I worked with C. Elegans during my master's and glad I found this channel. Uh, microscopes are an amazing tool. Um, thanks, TV face. Um, normally, I stream from uh, from my scanning electron microscope, which I will be doing tomorrow from 1 until 3. Um, and then in the evenings, I usually use my light microscope occasionally. Good news, everyone! Um, a little less frequently, but um, now the semester is starting to wrap up, so I don't have quite as many responsibilities and classes. Good news, everyone! Uh, thank you for all those follows, by the way. Um, this 
guy is, uh, he's a, a lot of entertainment for me. Yeah. Um, the more you look at them, the more they end up kind of looking like shrimps. Somebody mixed a shrimp together with something because their back legs kind of have like, you know, hooked, curled body. They don't have much control over them uh, in terms of dexterity like the rest of their limbs. So. Um, let's see if I switch back over to Dark Field. How this looks. Oops, I need to make it a little bit brighter for you. how much more blurry the image is uh, as a result of um, using light that's coming from an oblique angle. So there's a lot of scattering as a result of that, and so the image doesn't look as sharp when you're zoomed in. Um, if we zoom back out, it'll still look sharp at, uh, you know, the normal magnifications, but when you get really zoomed in, you lose a lot of the resolution because the light scatters um, around the um, the dark field stop. So, uh, makes for an interesting, more sort of artsy look uh, in the dark, but I feel like um, I'm sort of a uh, focus based um, mindset with a lot of this stuff, so the tighter the focus is, the better for me, usually. Um, the other thing that happens when I switch to dark field is I have to. if I turn take the polarizer out on one end or the other because then it can be a little bit brighter yeah and we can get a little bit more light coming in it's still scattered but um, this is my new microscope uh, which has a dark field stop my microscopes at school I don't usually get dark field for because um, I mostly look at diatoms, and there's not a whole lot of purpose for dark field for diatoms, but um, if you're looking at living stuff like this, or rotifers, or nematodes, um, I think there's an appeal to it. And especially if I'm going to stream from it, I think the dark field is kind of cool. Um, big zinc, what are diatoms? There's a command for that. Um, was he a bark resident? Yes. Um, you got another silly question. Were they ever dissected? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, I'm sure people have dissected a water bear before. I've never done it. Um, they're really small, so I imagine that requires a lot of work. Um... Damn me, the stick on Discord. Green tube reaction is not working. Oh, I'm not sure what that's about. Um, I don't actually see. Oh, if you DM'd me on uh, on Discord, um, you can just post links in here. I think it'll it'll let you. By the way. I think I turned it on to like the lowest mod settings and, uh, and turned off the stream elements. Um, was being aggressive, overly aggressive. Okay, let's jump back up to Bright Field or DIC, and I'm gonna tweak the light a little bit. zoom around a little and see what else we can find. Um, there's a little rotifer that's digging our music. It's deciding it's gonna vibe. These things are crazy, but they're kind of fun.
This is the, uh, oops, there's a water bear right there. It just, it's been following us around, I guess. It wants to stay in the, in the scene. All right, let's look around a little bit, see what else we can find. Um, I know there's some rotifers and some more water bears in this sample. We saw some rotifers earlier. Something right there that looks like it hasn't rehydrated completely or maybe it's just sleeping. Um, one of the ways I can usually tell if there's something, if there's something moving around, uh, even if it's just a bit of the lichen moving around, uh, usually a good clue that there's something behind it. Um, especially if I'm not moving the stage. So uh, we've been doing everything at uh, 10x plus the eyepiece is another uh, 10 times magnification and then have been sort of zooming in and out. Um, that looks like maybe it's a, a bit of a water bear either a dead one or a sleeping one or one that hasn't rehydrated completely. Um, and here's a rotifer in the same condition. It's either sleeping or dead or not completely rehydrated. One of the things that's nice about that is it lets us zoom in and take a look at it. Um, so we can get a nice clean look at it. Because um, it's not kicking around very much. And then, uh, let's see this on there's a little arrow you can see here I think um, this is the, the foot of the rotifer and it uses this end to clamp on to things um, so it's a uh, it's got little toes normally they have three toes but I guess sometimes maybe they only have two or one of them is basically behind us in the field of view and then the top of the rotifer uh, in here is uh, where its mouth is usually located. And I think this one might be alive still because I think I see stuff moving around on the inside. But um, yeah, so some of its organs are still moving uh, in here. Oops, I bumped the stage. Now it's gone forever. I'm just gonna hide my arrow. Go uh, look around some more. See if we can find anybody else. <coughs> A little tiny nematode worm. It's not moving quite as much. Here's another one. They're all over in these samples. There's another one. Also not moving very much. And another. And another. Also not moving very much. Uh, perhaps it can get a better sense of, uh, of what they're like when they're not spazzing out like they normally do. There's another one. There's a lot of nematodes in the sample. Uh, the nematodes are basically just as resilient as water bears and rotifers are. Um, I mean, they were also dehydrated when I started. So, I mean, everything in here basically that's moving around was in the same kind of a state. Yeah, it was a nematode. So I saw a bunch of them actually. Uh, in a row. They're all in like one little area of the stage there. Um, I'm just kind of moving around to see what else I can find in here. Some sort, Something's moving this, uh, there's a little ciliate way in the background there. And then there's something that's moving that piece of lichen around. Something behind it crawling, but I don't know what it is. Probably a rotifer. Um, mostly seen rotifers and nematodes. The 
something spinning over there in the corner of the stage. I'm not sure what it is either. Um, I think there's a maybe a water bear. Something bigger, either water bear or rotifer on this lichen piece right here. I just saw it poke its head around uh, the outside, but uh, it's up at the top on your screen. Uh, probably the fastest things zooming around in here, uh, the very small things that are zooming around, are probably ciliates. Um, they're most common. Oh, it's a water bear. It's a different one than the one we were looking at, but it's the same species. Uh, big reddish brown color, armored plates, and uh, uh, the little newt newt snouts with the uh, uh, tiny little kind of appendage like things on them. So it's a different one. We were uh, we were on another other end of this uh, slide earlier. So there's at least two of them in this sample. I think I've seen even more than that uh, crawling around in here. Sometimes it takes a while for them to rehydrate. This one likes to hang out behind the junk, so I'm going to go look around some more, see if we can find some rotifers that are chilling out. Um, I'm pretty sure I also saw a mite in here. Uh, there's a rotifer crawling around. I saw an actual, like, uh, uh, mite crawling around in the sample when we, before, our, before I turned on the uh, stream. And I thought, oh, that'd be cool to see. Um, they're a lot bigger and, uh, often. And, uh, so there's another dead rotifer. Something else looks like a rotifer. Oh, there's a little tiny water bear. You see him crawling? Just to give you some contrast. That's a little tiny one, a baby. Now that one needs to eat so it can grow. That is a little water bear. And we're at seven times magnification uh, to get this thing this tight. And uh, the other one that we were looking at, um, we had it three times magnification and it was this big. So, I mean, just to give you some idea of the differences between them. Yeah, it's a, it's a water bear, uh, a tardigrade, Martin. Uh, you can tell because they have eight legs and the back two legs are kind of welded together right there. Um, and then the front six legs are all independent. They kind of like crawl around like a little helpless baby with those legs. Uh, we're just zoomed in super close. That's why it looks kind of funny. Uh, I can turn up the brightness just a little bit. That will help with the, uh, the image quality. And then uh, I can turn down, turn up the contrast a little. Um, I'm doing okay. Uh, so I've just got a little bit of a cold, but uh, nothing I can't manage. Um, I thought maybe it was just going to be allergies, but uh, it turned out it was uh, a little worse than allergies, I think. Because um, I don't usually get a sore throat from allergies. Although I suppose sometimes it can get really dry. Um, uh, my wife read something to me the other day that was like, Pollen production by plants is increasing. Uh, it's a water bear, icer, uh, tardigrade, and they probably are not in your bed. Uh, they usually live on sticks and in moss and lichen. And uh, there are some aquatic water bears that live in lakes and some in the ocean, but. Uh, He's a really little one. Uh, we saw a much bigger one earlier, Juban, a couple of them. Uh, the green is just some uh, interference coloring 
um, because of uh, their skin and the differential interference contrast lighting that I'm using. Um, it's giving it like a really strong green color. Um, you can see some of its like organs occasionally. Uh, probably not this little guy. It's probably a little too small for us to see much besides his legs and his face or his head. Um, but when we go back and look at the bigger one, maybe we can see some of it. Uh, I don't think we're looking at androplasmic reticulums. Um, those are really at the cellular level and we're not at the cellular level. Um, I'm gonna look around a little bit though. See what else we can find. That's just one little water bear. This little zoomy thing right here, that's, oh, it's gone already. Um, that was probably a, a, a ciliate. They're pretty common. Um, there's a nematode worm. Um, I have some bad news for you, uh, Icer. These might actually be in your bed. Uh, I don't know. They're everywhere, basically, so. But they're pretty chill, pretty chill so I wouldn't worry about them too much. There's a rotifer hiding in behind the debris right there. Oh, and another little water bear. You see him? Um, that's a rotifer right there. It's not a worm. Uh, the nematode was a worm, yeah. But that right there is a, a rotifer. Um, it's, you can see its antenna sticking up. And then on the, um, the piece that's above it, so. That's the rotifer. Um, you can see, oops, can, we're just a little too zoomed in. You can see its foot. There we go. Uh, the thing that's sticking up above its head is a little antenna. It's a sensory tool that they have. And then uh, they attach with, with a little foot, um, with little toes that grasp things. That's um, what's in the v field of view at the top right now. And its head is down. Um, where the antenna is sticking up is its head. And, uh, and then they have uh, cilia around their, their mouth um, that they spin around to draw food in. Uh, there's probably nematodes in your bed. I don't know. I've never been to your bed. But uh, they're everywhere, so, uh, and they're dust sized, so they get into everything. Um, I wouldn't doubt that there's nematodes in your bed. Highly likely. They're harmless, though. They're not gonna bother you. And then, uh, here's another rotifer. Somewhere back here, hiding in one of these little debris piles out right there. Oops, now it's crawled around again. Uh, that's another rotifer. Although I swear I also saw a, a water bear crawling around in here as well. I think maybe it's on this little piece of debris, but it's on the back side. Um, that's what, those are all rotifers, though. They're all deloid rotifers, which are uh, specialists that can dehydrate and rehydrate pretty pretty well. Um, they can withstand really high levels of UV radiation, and pretty much everything uh, water bears can do, those rotifers can do, except for um, not necessarily uh, like acid conditions and stuff like that. But they're pretty good at uh, anything that can dehydrate come back from being dehydrated is usually pretty good at withstanding UV radiation uh, and like desiccation is a somehow linked together with uh, genetic repair and so usually if you're good at one you're good at both Nematode, I mean. Wiggling around. Uh, dust mites, for sure, yeah. 
Yeah, the face mites. Um, uh, there are definitely some face mites. Although, I will tell you, we went looking for them. Uh, and basically, we tested everyone in the lab. Oh, here's another little water bear. Off on its own. We can zoom in on it. We went looking for those eyebrow mites, and we never found them. Um, I mean, I pulled out, plucked some of my actual eyebrows and eyelashes, put them in the light microscope. Um, they're supposed to be around the follicle, and I couldn't find any. Um, we did it with a bunch of my students in the lab, tested some people from the department. Um, we never found any. I was a little disappointed, actually. Uh, they don't actually infect everybody, or infest everybody, I should say. Um, it's a small fraction of people, and it usually is like the older you get, the more likely you are to have been uh, uh, infested with uh, face mites. Um, it's also possible I just, you know, missed them, but uh, we didn't find them on anybody, so... Either we have a pretty healthy population of people without face mites, or um, uh, or they're harder to find than people suggest, which is also possible. There's dust mites everywhere, though. Yeah. Uh, we cannot see the cells of a tardigrade on a light microscope. Um, their cells are very small. So I don't know what sort of uh, magnification we would need to be at, but uh, my microscope probably couldn't handle it. Uh, I think I could get the 20x in there without it, it bumping any liquid. Nope, it's catching. So I've got a little too much water on the slide to even get the 20x in. Um, so we're just going to go with the 10 for now. zoom in on it optically. It actually gives us a little more depth to do that because uh, the 20x objective is going to interfere with the... Uh... Oops, sorry, I was playing with camera settings I shouldn't be messing with. Uh, there's a little bit more depth of field when you look at them uh, this way. This one's just very small, like the other one that we were looking at. Yeah, maybe it's regional. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get him to dance to the music. I suppose if we find the right music, maybe they will. Yeah, you can get a really nice view of the, the little claws on the ends of their legs. And it's a little mouth going newt, 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 newt. Uh, right there. They're just very, very small, this one. Um, the other ones that we saw, again, they were probably a different species, but they were much bigger than these. We've seen sort of two classes, this little one. Um, also, if you note, look around the actual uh, newt, newt structure. They don't have the... Uh, a little thing that sticks off the face like the other one did. So I think it's a different species. Uh, oh, you know what? Um, I don't think I have a uh, Tardy B on my uh, my new computer, unfortunately. Yeah, um, I don't know if they make a sound we'd be able to hear because they're, you know, underwater organisms for the most part when they're active. Um, I imagine they say newt newt though. <laughs> the tiniest little roar. Maybe they sound like pirates. Maybe all this time we shouldn't be calling them bears. You never know. Good 
news, everyone. <laughs> Get pity gump. Thanks for the follow. I'm just chilling out tonight. Listen to some tunes, watching some water bears kick around. Pretty laid back. Uh, let's see what else we can find. We'll let this one, give this one a break. Let's see, I need to pop back out to full size for you so you can see where we're going. There's another nematode and a rotifer. A couple of rotifers, it looks like. First being interfered with by the nematode a little. And I see something else on there as well. Uh, right? That is just barely moving. I think maybe another rotifer? Oh, that one's got its uh, corona out spinning. Let's see if we can get that zoomed in. Button. There we go. There you can see the corona spinning. They're not really spinning, but wiggling around. And you can see it's sort of drawing a current towards itself and the particles that are kind of moving around in the background as a result. So that little part that you can see, uh, let's see, let me use my new arrow right here. It looks like a heart that's beating is actually the mastax, which is sort of like their internal jaw. And um, up here spinning around at the top, uh, it's got little hairs called a corona. It's got two of them, like a, two, like a twin propeller engine on a plane. And it spins those and you can see all the particles here being pulled towards it. And then there's sort of a jet trail behind it as well of particles that are being carried. And you can see the current that's pulling all the particles along uh, towards the mouth. And then it just, uh, sometimes it will, um, so its mouth is sort of right in here and then uh, it goes through some sort of a little tube to the jaws and then its stomach is in here, right? So post, post jaw um, and that's attached with its foot at the base so <laughs> yeah it's like a, like a vacuum cleaner um, kind of you know how they have uh, those spinning heads right <laughs> um, so we can get in nice and close uh, when they sit still that part right there is the antenna That's the antenna, um, and then these are uh, the, the cilia um, around the top of the corona. It's taking itself a little out of focus, so I'm gonna fix that for us. You can see it can basically put its, uh, put its jaws away. <laughs> hey, line wizard, how's it going? Uh, this is DIC, yeah. Um, I can tweak the DIC a little if you want, uh, so you can get a sense of... And now I've got like really heavy DIC, extra contrast on it. And then I still have to focus it, so... There you go. It's a nice, rich image with the DIC. Um, and I have the... Uh, the relief tightened down pretty hard on it, so um, so we can get nice high relief, but it cuts down on the resolution a little because uh, there's less light coming in. But uh, it gives us a little bit greater depth of field. Uh, they can reject particles. <laughs> Vacuums of the water world. Um, 
is it Tinea? I don't know. Is that the genus, Martin? I don't actually know um, rotifer uh, genera. I'm not a person who studies rotifers. Um, I know this is a deloid rotifer, um, which is sort of like the family, but uh, I don't know the actual um, genus or anything like that. Um, we throw some diatoms on here. I can tell you diatom genera all day long. Um, pretty much anything you put in front of me. Unless it's marine, uh, I probably could tell you what it is. It's a genus, but uh, rotifers don't know them very well. Um, I, you know, there's a few of them I recognize. Where's the sample from? Uh, a stick from my yard. Uh, it just fell off a tree, and um, this isn't the actual stick. I put it back out on my porch, but. Um, uh, just a simple stick with lichen growing on it like this. Um, and then I scraped the lichen into a bowl uh, using a, um, a simple paring knife like this. Um, just like holding it vertically against the stick and kind of uh, scraping the lichen. And um, I could showcase that probably. Hang on, let's see. So you can see in here, oops, sorry about that. Um, it's just some of the lichen that's scraped off of the tree with a little bit of tree bark as well. And, um, and then I just have a transfer pipe that I pull some of it into, and then I'll let it settle um, so that it's all down on one end. And then I just uh, put that into the, uh, onto a uh, microscope slide. Relatively simple process. Um, yeah. Uh, more interesting ciliates. Yeah. That's <laughs> like a biological chainsaw. Um, it is more like a vacuum cleaner than a chainsaw. Uh, I mean, it looks dangerous, but I don't think it could actually cut you uh, or anything else for that matter. Um, they're just little hairs. So. Um, that it's spinning. But you do get a good sense of the current. Uh, you can see the particles moving towards it. Uh, and sometimes you can see particles, like a little vortex on either side, and then a trail of stuff that's moving, like, uh, let's see, I'll turn my little arrow back on. You can see there's sort of a vortex in here, and then also on the other side, a bit of a vortex. And then you can see the particles drifting back here behind him, uh, her. I could, uh, it doesn't like it when I bump the stage a lot, so. Um, and then you can also see the, the mast axe in here, this piece, uh, which is how it eats. You see once it starts opening the, uh, the corona, and then its mouth opens, then the, uh, the mast axe starts pumping. So, uh, it's just, that's how it chews. <laughs> Um, is it distilled water? I use rope here. Uh, believe it or not, I have rope here in my house. Um, we have like a nine gallon rope here tank in the basement. Um, reverse osmosis purified water uh, that we use for ice cubes and drinking water. Um, the water in Terre Haute is not great, but uh, my wife's uh, dad is also likes to buy us things, and that's one of the things he bought us. So um, I use it for our fish. Yeah, they look pretty different in DIC. Um, I can switch over to Brightfield if you want. I can also switch over to Darkfield. I haven't really looked at. Uh, I haven't looked at these very much in Darkfield. Give me a second. Take a little bit of light adjustment. spazzing out. Let's see how this thing looks in dark field. Uh, so the image quality is always a lot lower, as I mentioned. Um, it might look a little bit better if I zoom out, actually. Yeah. Um, 
part of the problem is in dark field, um, you're diffracting the light. It's like bending. And because I have it um, on a water droplet, and this thing is really small, um, you know, we've been super zoomed in on it. Um, the other thing is I can't get really high uh, relief from this sample. Uh, for my dark field because I have to have the light all the way up basically so the diaphragms open all the way Good news everyone That's the dark field view this little tiny rotifer they look pretty good when they're bigger But this one's a little too small to really see well it's Just always gonna look a little blurry. <laughs> it pulled something in its mouth. It's a little too big Good news, everyone. Put the light back down into I see for a minute. Sorry about that. There we go. And then we'll just go look around a little more. Um, yeah, it's always tr it's always problematic um, to get good light quality, zoomed in really high um, in dark field. And also it would help if I had a cover slip on. Um, this is just an open sample with no cover slip, so uh, that's part of the issue as well. Oh, thank you for the cheer, Smooch. That's very generous. Um, yeah, it can hide the wheels inside itself. That's what they do. Uh, they, um, they pull them in when they don't need to feed, and then when uh, when they're getting ready to feed, when they think that the water has something in it that they might munch on, they turn on the uh, the brushes, start wiggling food towards their face, and then uh, and pull them out. So this is being pushed around by a, a nematode. Yeah, there is something back here behind this, uh, right there. It's not coming out, but I think it's a rotifer. Yeah, there it is. A little tiny rotifer. Here's a water bear, a bigger one. Actually, uh, let's see, that's a water bear and a rotifer together in our field of view. That's a big old water bear. Um, and we can zoom in on that one pretty nicely, probably. Oops, I stopped pushing the wrong button again. There we go. Let me fix the optics. So I need to push the... Helps if you have the camera set up correctly and the microscope set up correctly for DIC. There we go. There's a little water bear for you. Oops. It's managed to... It's making making some headway towards this pile of debris to hide behind. <laughs> Music goes well, thank you. Uh, rotifer, I think they're two, um, water bears and rotifers are probably, this one's just inserting himself over here. He's trying to photobomb us. Um, I think they're they're basically the same size class, so they don't interfere with each other very much. Um, because the rotifers mostly are filter feeders, so they spin those little brushes and pull food towards their mouth. I think probably they eat different food sources. Um, I mean, they pull, probably eat algae, but um, water bears tend to kind of crawl around and snorkel food into their mouths. So they're eating things that are kind of attached. Uh, they may scrape some algae basically into their mouths. Whereas the um, rotifers probably eat a lot more bacteria and things that kind of, yeah. <laughs> their little legs don't propel themselves very well. Well, um, they're meant for grasping onto things. So you can see they have little claws at the ends and um, they're used to living on uh, a substrate that they're attached to and then they're pretty good at crawling around with them um, but when they get detached like this because uh, they're you know it's a glass slide that they're sitting on um, 
they have a little bit more trouble, right? Yeah, the cover slip is some sort of index of refraction thing that creates problems. So, uh, if we can create a scenario where these animals could threaten mankind. <laughs> Hang on a second, I gotta sneeze. Maybe I don't. Uh, Alright, so, uh... Well, um, it'd be nice if Pacific Plankton could get her own SEM, but uh, she probably couldn't afford it. Um, I only have them because I have a research lab at a university, so. Um, could we technically image a live water bear on the SEM? Probably not. Uh, I do have an E SEM, and it, it Good does. Good news, everyone! It does. <laughs> Tardy Gravy. Good name. Hopefully we're not going to make any gravy out of our tardy bears, our water bears. Um, but uh, I do have an, uh, an, a low vac mode on my SCM that I could use. We could try it, um, but it, it it doesn't very, do very well. Um, it's still a vacuum, and water bears. Uh, only survive in vacuum when they're in their ton state. Um, so they get dehydrated and switch into their cryptobiotic state. Uh, then they can survive in a vacuum. So it probably would contract uh, and then it wouldn't look much like a water bear. Normally to prepare water bears for an SEM, people do all kinds of uh, silicification of their exoskeleton. And um, it uh, makes it like a rigid, uh, silicified structure. So I have to do some sort of chemical treatment of the skeleton to keep it from just dehydrating and turning into what looks like a, somebody sucked the air out of an air mattress, basically. Um, which is what happens when I put them on the SEM. They look like a garbage bag, basically, with claws and, uh, and that's it. Um, those really nice SEM images you see of water bears, they're always, they've been treated chemically so that they can actually like withstand uh, the vacuum without turning into like a garbage bag. Um. <laughs> uh, they did take some into space. Uh, hello Dangling, how are you? Uh, look, we're looking at water bears on the uh, light microscope. Um, the ones that they took into space, again, they were in their tune state or their um, cryptobiotic state. And so they um, they weren't walking around in outer space the way that people project them to be. They were, uh, you know, curled up in a little ball, uh, persisting, basically. Um, but, uh, you know, they're not usually active when they're in their resistant state. So, I mean, even if we had one and we could put it in the SEM uh, and it would live through it, we probably would need to sputter coat it with gold, which will kill it. Um, and then that also happens in a high vac. So, um, you know, the vacuum would probably create an issue for it. Uh, it could possibly live on the other side of it and be able to reproduce, but uh, um, I don't think that that would, I don't want to put an organism through that uh, just in case. So normally I would not do that. We have looked at some water bears on the SEM, um, but they were already dead. Uh, they already looked like trash bags before I started. I didn't kill anything, so. Uh, I read somewhere that they accidentally spilled some on the moon. Yeah, there's uh, supposed to be some tardy grades on the moon. Great to see some proper science and tech instead of just uh, livestock cams. Well, uh, I mean, in a way, we're looking at some livestock. Uh, they're uh, microscopic livestock. Uh, I didn't exactly farm them, but I do have a, uh, a collection of all of my water bear samples here, um, post uh, post analysis. I usually uh, keep them in that jar, and then eventually I just put it back in the yard somewhere. Um, I guess technically it's not a farm. But uh, you could look at it that way, I suppose. Uh, did I collect this myself? Absolutely. 
Um, I collected it before we started the stream from a stick using uh, this knife and uh, scraped the lichen off of a stick, an old stick that had fallen into my yard. Um, I, it's snowing out there right now. Um, I live in Indiana, uh, in the U.S., and uh, it's snowing right now. So I went out right before the snow and uh, collected a stick. Uh, it, the ground was still a little wet from raining earlier today. And so I thought, oh, this is probably a good opportunity to pick up some uh, water bear samples. And, uh, and then maybe like 10 minutes before I started streaming, I scraped it, uh, the stick off into one of those dishes and uh, filled it with some rope pure water and then stuck it on a slide. And here we are. So that thing that went zooming through right there, that's a uh, silly it probably. Just swimming around. Um, I don't know if you're still here, Line Wizard, uh, but uh, if you're looking for interesting, um, uh, if you're looking for interesting uh, ciliates, um, you might try looking in samples with uh, duckweed. Um, I don't know what you normally look through. I have some ciliates. I have a, a sample from my koi pond here that I was looking at the other night. Um, that had a bunch of ciliates in it, so we could jump over to that if people are bored with water bears um, and uh, and rotifers. It's a little bit of a bigger rotifer right there. Maybe we can zoom in on. There we go. That one's a little bit bigger than the ones we've been looking at. It's just sort of writhing around a bit. Oh, it's repositioning itself. Hang on. Can't find a place where it wants to stay. There we go. This is a lot bigger than the one we were looking at before. Um, it might actually look pretty good in dark field. the other day I wanted to find a stentor. I've actually never found one. Um, but I also don't sample in a lot of like anoxic conditions. And I think that's probably a thing they specialize in. Hey Jay, how's it going? How's things? Um, let's see. Uh, get my mouse to respond here. Sometimes when I have the, uh, the camera going, it doesn't want to, doesn't want to respond. Uh, you've been looking for Stentor and Hydra. I haven't seen either of those things. So um, I can't give you good advice on those. <laughs> a stripping tardy grade stream. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a duck. That part's true. Well, my cat wants to see what I've got on the microscope, so... Um, what drives their movement? Um, yeah, it's probably a sense of chemical, like what we would think of as smelling. Um, but they also just kind of grope around a lot of the times. Um, and light probably has some influence. Um, there's probably a bunch of different things depending on what the organisms are. Uh, it's lichen, yeah. I've never find them in mosses. I only find them in, uh... I've only found them in lichen um, when I've looked. Yeah, there's a nematode down there in the corner for you. Hopefully you're doing well. Welcome in. Uh, if I could get to my mouse to listen to me for a second, I would send out some... <laughs> the camera and the mouse together don't work very well. Um, Good news, everyone! Thank you for the follow. Um, I give a shout out to Jay Renzella. Jay does a bunch of wood carving and uh, really spectacular stuff. Some of it's science-based. Um, you should check him out if you get a chance. And um, I should give also a little squad. If you're really interested in microscope streamers, there's a whole list of them right there. Uh, my normal partner in crime on Twitch is uh, uh, Pacific Plankton. 
She asked me if I was going to be streaming tonight because she didn't want to miss it, and then it seems like she's going to miss it. Um, but she's usually here moderating my channel. Um, Del Maxim, also a good friend of mine who does a bunch of streaming um, occasionally from his microscope. Usually starts out that way. Open Set, um, another really well-known streamer who does uh, microscope stuff with uh, synthesizers that he plays and sets music to in the background. It's really cool. Does a bunch of psychedelic um, uh, visuals for his stuff as well, which is cool. Let's see. I'm going to just look around a little bit in this sample, and then maybe we'll move over and look at the... Uh, there's a little water bear. We've seen a bunch of them. Uh, this one's just barely moving. It's a little sleepy. It's also out in the middle of nowhere, so maybe it's uh, tired from trying to find uh, something to grab onto. I don't know. There you go. There's a little tiny one. That one's about a third as big as the bigger one that we were looking at. Uh, yeah, so also Line Wizard does some streaming uh, from Microscope. Uh, he's a new streamer. You should give him uh, a look. Um, does regular tap water have anything interesting in it? In my experience, no. Um, it probably has some bacteria in it, but um, you really can't see bacteria very well. Um, I'm back. I was watching Amanda struggle with picking PC parts. How am I doing? I'm doing well. Hopefully Amanda is doing well. Uh, you know, we're just zooming around looking at stuff in the microscope still, so you haven't missed a whole lot. You're going to stream tomorrow? Okay, good. <laughs> Auto translate translated Del Maximum from the Maximum. Is he from the Maximum or is he to the Maximum? That's the question. All right, let's get into the thick of this slide somewhere. I promised there was a... Uh, at some point, I was when I first started looking around in here, I found a, a mite. And I just want to see if I can find it again before the sample completely dries out. Um, I do find mites sometimes wandering around in these samples. Um, more frequently, I just find their molts or carcasses. Um, it's a, a dead nematode. There's a really thick uh, bit of lichen right here, and there's a nematode hiding behind it. Uh, first time I put the sample on and I was busy messing around with my settings, uh, it dried out a little and then I put a little bit more on, uh, more sample on, and when I did, it added more mass, so the middle of the slide has got a really like dense amount of material on it. There's a rotifer. crawling around on the surface here and another one up here that's a rotifer I'm not sure we'll find the mite maybe it's in this mass of stuff in here and then we'll never find it um, but it was walking around so who knows where it ended up that is a rotifer, and then uh, a dead rotifer, and it looks like a barely moving nematode. There's a big rotifer, and there's a rotifer with its corona out, hanging out in the shadows. Let's see if I can fix that lighting a little. microscopic world. It's a good view of a rotifer with both of its uh, corona out spinning cilia. Uh, around 9 to 11 p.m. That's okay. Um, uh, 
Yeah, my daughter got me a little sick. How quickly do diatoms usually move? They're pretty slow. Um, and I have no idea how they move. I couldn't explain it to you if I tried. They kind of crawl around like snails do. Uh, mysterious traction forces. Um, do these animals show some sort of life consciousness? Uh, probably not as you and I would experience it. Um, I mean, I suspect they they know where food is, they know when the environment around them changes uh, with whatever sensory components that they have, but uh, do I think they're listening to the music going, this, uh, this beat really slaps? No. Uh, I don't think that they have a real sense of um, of themselves like that. Could be wrong. There's a bunch of dead rotifers right here. It's very interesting. Sometimes we come across like a patch where there's a bunch of rotifers. Sometimes there's like a patch of nematodes and then it's like all of a sudden there's a bunch of water bears in a little area. That's a uh, rotifer hanging out back there. And there's a nematode in the very back. Something's crawling around on the back side of that one. Nematode. Rotifer. Nematode. And a rotifer. So that rotifer is just waking up. It's been hanging out here for a while. Uh, evening stream will be good for me. Um, tomorrow I should be streaming from the SEM from 1 until 3. So if you're interested in that, I'll probably put some pollen on again. I found some uh, magnolia that were still in bloom. And I got some strawberry uh, flowers in my yard that I wanted to see what their pollen looked like. And uh, we'll see what else I can find. I found some interesting looking flowering trees the other day. And I was like, ah, let's go see what their pollen looks like. But I'm not sure I know what the actual tree is, so I'm gonna have to take a picture of it and uh, eye naturalist or something and figure it out. Um, I'm kind of on like a mini vacation this week uh, through a series of just, oh, there's something, oh, it's a rotifer. Uh, interesting coincidence of my schedule uh, I have a quiz that I'm giving in one of my classes on uh, Thursday. Somebody's teaching my Friday class as a guest uh, instructor. And uh, my other class on Thursday is done. Uh, students are just working on the projects. And uh, the other class I have, they're watching a video, but the video is available on YouTube, so I just had them watch it from home. So uh, I have no classes this week after this. Today was my last day. Um, and then next week is actually kind of light as well. I have a couple of lectures I have to give, but just two, um, which is for me an incredibly light load. And I'm looking forward to not doing a lot, uh, just working on research and, um, oh, there's a water bear, a bigger one. Let's see, I'm going to play with the light a little bit. And a bigger one, maybe I'll try a dark field view of it. So I gotta pull out the analyzer, try to get enough light in here.
the nematode keeps hitting the piece of lichen that it's crawling on, giving it a hard time. seen videos of predatory protists that seem to clearly demonstrate recognition of other members of their species. So, I mean, that's, um, I'm not sure if that's consciousness so much as, um, I mean, being able to recognize your species is a sign of an important, uh, skill if you're going to mate. So, um, food from non-food, uh, most of these things, it's probably what fits in their mouth. Um, you know, honestly, uh, relatively simple. Uh, their response might be to try to stick it in their mouth and then, uh... Good news, everyone! Um, and then see if it tastes like food, and then if it doesn't, spit it back out. Uh... I know rotifers, that's their strategy, is just particle rejection. If it doesn't seem like it's food, they spit it back out, so... Um, it's a little more... Uh, um, a little more challenging uh, when you're just sitting there spinning some little wheels trying to get food to go in uh, to know whether what you've put in your mouth is food or not, but uh, nematodes are really causing problems for us. Okay, let's zoom back out. Oops, am I all the way out? Is that what's going on? Oh, I was all the way out, okay. Let's see if we can find something else in here that's worth chasing around a bit. that's kind of drifting with the current. Uh, that might be a water bear egg, actually, right there. They kind of look like that. A little spiky ball. Yeah, I mean, there are organisms that eat their own species. Um, uh, perch, for example. Uh, you know, the big fish eat the little ones, basically. If it fits in their mouth, uh, they'll eat it. And so it doesn't matter if it's their own species or even their own, uh, you know, offspring in some cases. Um, you know, because a lot of them just lay eggs and then leave them. So, uh, I don't know. I'm not a uh, neuroscientist, so it's a little beyond me. Um, I did find a mite, though. Pretty sure that's him right there. Uh, that little orangish blob that's moving around is uh, a mite. The reason it, its legs are moving right there, I can see. And then on the surface, see the little hairs? Uh, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. You might be able to see them. Uh, the whole package of stuff is moving in there, but um, that's a water mite. Zoom back out a little bit. Get in our field of view. I mean, those are interesting conversations to have. Um, I, I, I guess I can speculate a little bit, and that's about it. Good news, everyone! Uh, a few good taters. That's a good name. Welcome in. Thank you for the follow. And, uh... This mite's less exciting than I thought I would be, because he's just stuck in a pile of, uh... uh lichen in here. He's kind of crawling around a bit, but, uh... I would be moving a little bit more. Um, let's see. Um, get my mouse 
supposed to work. Um, it's this thing here that is the mite, and you can see one of its legs right here, and also one of its legs is in here moving particles around. There goes another one of its legs moving. So mites have eight legs, they're not insects. Um, arthropods, yes, but insects, no. Um, and I usually find them dead in samples, I don't usually see them crawling around, but um, that's its leg right there. Head is here somewhere. I'm not sure if it's eating uh, lichen material or what it's doing, but uh, it's very much underneath um, this pile of lichen, and as a result, the light is kind of bending in through here, not very, not very cleanly. So, uh, but I'm sure that's what it is, uh, in in part because of the way that it's moving. And also because I was uh, on the sample earlier looking around and I saw a mite. So I know that, that there was one in here. <sighs> you like critters? Well, that's good. Uh, we have critters on here pretty regularly in the evening streams. In my um, SCM streams, we sometimes put critters on. Um, more frequently, we're looking at diatoms. Uh, but today, um, I haven't looked at any diatoms at all because we've been looking at a lichen sample. Yeah. That's one of the things about it is there's probably a lot of... Oh, it's finally busting away from some of the lichen. Um, you can see a bit of its head. It's crawling around in there. I did my um, undergraduate in geology. I have a master's in geology, and uh, I have a PhD in geology, but with a focus on diatom paleoecology. And uh, I teach classes in environmental science uh, and geology. And so uh, most of my Biology, biology background is actually either in long-term evolution of organisms, uh, not at the genetic level, but like looking at ultrastructure um, and uh, skeletal components of fossils. Um, now it's moved itself entirely behind uh, the lichen. Um, and in ecology, paleoecology. So um, I don't focus so much in, um, in the biological aspects of it, although there are that, that is definitely a part of um, understanding the ecology. There's a little water bear right there out in the open. That's a big one. Uh, we've seen two types today. These sort of brownish colored ones with the uh, star-shaped uh, sort of proboscis looking thing that's this one and then the smaller variety um, that doesn't have the red coloring so these ones have sort of like a like a mole mouth little feelers around it and they have eyes and they have little eye stalks as well um, and the smaller ones that we saw I don't know that it even had eyes um, and their heads didn't have little uh, figgledy bits around the mouths, so um, around their new newt. Um, but you can see the claws really well on this one. And we know it's a water bear because it has eight legs. Um, unlike the rotifers that are here, they just have one foot with some claws and also uh, less than perfect view of it because the water drop is starting to dry up on the surface and so everything's got a bit of a, a meniscus uh, distortion around it which is another reason why it wouldn't be a bad idea to move on it looks like maybe it's molting uh, it looks like maybe it's coming out of a molt you see that um, it's like struggling to break free from something and then uh, um, if I 
turn on the arrow, you can see right here, it's like part of the exoskeleton is not attached to anything. And these claws out here aren't attached to anything. And so I think it's actually trying to wiggle its way out of its previous exoskeleton. And this molt uh, right here is, it's like gonna break free of. Um, for organisms that, uh, that have an exoskeleton, they have to molt in order to grow. So if it's gonna get to be a bigger water bear, it has to um, basically shed its skin and then it will grow a bit and then it will reharden its exoskeleton. So they're usually most vulnerable right after they molt. And um, for many female water bear, uh, they will molt and then they will lay their eggs into the molt directly. And that one is definitely molting. So you can see it's basically trying to crawl out of its skin. Yeah, that's exactly the same way. Um, as you can see, it's basically shedding its skin. And um, as I mentioned, the female water bears, they'll, they'll lay their eggs sometimes right into the exoskeleton as a way to protect uh, their offspring. Yeah, it's pretty cool, uh, seeing it actually molt. You can see how much it's struggling to get out of its sleeping bag. <laughs> it looks like me when I wake up after I've been camping for a while. It's cold out. What do you want Wednesday, huh? You want to get on the stream? Okay. This is Wednesday. Every time I stream, she has to insert herself. She wants to see what I'm doing up here. You want to get on the microscope. Okay, let's look in the microscope. Is there anything good in there? There's no treats. We just want treats. You want to show off to everybody how fat you are. Yeah, I know. You're fat. You're a big fat cat. Yeah. Look at you. Yeah, it's almost completely broken out, uh, but it's also worked its way uh, behind that. There, you can see the molt sort of breaking free. I think it's completely escaped. Right? There's the molt. The water bear's crawling around outside of it now. There you go. Uh, and it doesn't look like this one laid any eggs in there, at least not yet. Uh, sometimes when uh, water bears are kind of gross, uh, sometimes when they molt like this, they lay their eggs in there and then the male uh, water bears will come along and uh, will have sex with the molt, basically. So, uh, to put the sperm on the eggs um, but now it's just a molt it's out it broke free and uh, our water bear is crawling around on the screen somewhere no more uh, in our field of view but behind one of these blobs back here of uh, lichen good news everyone pretty cool it was pretty cool to watch, right? We saw the whole thing happen. It was basically just barely out when we started. And uh, I think that's our water bear up there. Our newly molted water bear is behind this. Yep, there it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I think they reproduce sexually, um, most of them. I think our sexual reproduction. Um, but they can probably, they probably have a, um, a parthenogenic reproduction as well. Hershey, um, I find them very easily just by uh, going into my yard and picking up a stick. Uh, as 
As anticlimactic as that sounds, that's basically all I did. Um, so I just found a stick with some lichen on it, scraped the lichen into a bowl, added some reverse osmosis purified water, and put it on the slide. Uh, it was relatively easy. Um, the hard part is having the patience to look around for them. Um, I think there may be a half a dozen or more water bears in this sample. Um, uh, at least that we've seen. Um, some little ones and some big ones. When I first started, I only saw two. And I thought, oh, there's not a lot in here. But the longer I sat and watched, uh, the more water bears appeared. So it takes them a little bit, of, uh, a little while for them to uh, um, rehydrate and sort of get their bearings sometimes, no pun intended. Um, and that one that we're looking at there just molted. We watched it molt. So and the molt's over here somewhere, just hanging out by itself now, separated from the water bear. It's right there. Um, you can see it right there. That's the molt. You can see the little legs on it. And the water bear is now over here. That was really cool. It's nice to, um, to catch that in the process of happening. There's the water bear. Let's come back into our field of view. Uh, the worm that we, that was over here, uh, somewhere, is a, uh, well, that one up there is a rotifer, and the one that's right here behind, uh, the water bear is a nematode. Yeah, but they, um, you know, one of the things with the water bears is you kind of just have to be patient. You have to put enough material on your sample to find them, and then as it starts to dry out, uh, the optics get a little bit worse. Um, but uh, the water bears actually can get more traction when the sample starts to get a little drier, when it's not quite, quite as water rich. Um, so they can actually, like this is an ideal time for catching them because they, they can move around a lot more easily. Uh, let's go look around a bit and see what else we can find. We've kind of seen a lot. I think we've seen most of the organisms that are present in here. Um, I have found water bear eggs before inside a molt, and um, I found some that are basically separated from molts before. Oh, that is a right in the center of the field of view there, not the thing that's moving around. That's a rotifer, but uh, and there's a nematode in the background. But that dark brown thing right there, sorry, right here, that dark brown thing is. Uh, the molt or the dead body from a mite, uh, a water mite. Uh, I guess it's just a mite mite, soil mite probably. You can see it's an exoskeleton. I can actually see the parts of it pretty easily in here from the exoskeleton. We saw a mite earlier that was crawling around in the lichen, a uh, smaller one. <coughs> so probably not the one that uh, left that molt. Um, also hiding on these samples are a bunch of testate amoeba. So uh, right here, this thing is an archella. It's a type of uh, testate amoeba. Um, but they move really slowly, and um, they, sometimes they don't come out. Sometimes the little pseudopods just stay, or they just little tiny um, streamers of them come out. So. You have to be really patient if you want to see one of those crawl around, but I think they're really beautiful. And they're pretty common in lichen as well. I find them also in lake samples. It's a little ciliate zooming around in the background. And two little rotifers right next to each other right there in the middle. And you can really see the meniscus halo right here around um, around the outside, this orange diffraction that's occurring everywhere. It's because the water's really starting to dry up and the light's basically just diffracting around the, um, the lichen particles. Okay, so 
So we've had the sample on for a really long time. It's been zooming around inside the same sample, so I'm gonna make up a. Um... I know Pacific. It's nice to see you. Um, I put some pretzel rock on in the background for the first time ever. I feel like it works well for the night streams. Um, you know, just to have a little low-key music in the background since we're just chilling out anyway. And then uh, I can let it play while I'm busy looking at stuff. Let's see. I'm gonna try to pull out some material from the from my pond. We've been looking at water bear samples for most of the night, so. Should reach saturation with it. Um, for this one, I actually will put a cover slip on. I'm running without the cover slip, so it sort of limits the focal height that we can get things at. There's lots of stuff still going on in here. Other sample got on my 20x objective. Probably need to take everything apart and clean it again. So, um, did you get your YouTube video up done finally? That's good. I haven't seen it yet. I'm gonna take a look at it. Uh, in PCR protocol, Thermus aquaticus bacteria polymerized enzyme is used commonly because they can live above 70 degrees Celsius and their enzyme is strong. Yeah. Uh, well, tardigrades don't actually live in those conditions. Uh, the difference is that that bacteria, Thermus aquaticus, is actually alive in those conditions. Um, water bears, Martin, um, when the temperatures are high like that, they're already in their cryptobiotic state. So. Um, they don't persist in those, I mean, they just basically weather those conditions more than anything else. They don't really like um, live in those uh, conditions. So they're not like crawling around and whatever else. Oh, I've got a uh, Jelks and somebody who's asking me about their uh, microscope streaming. Uh, take a look at it. Definitely Jolkson. We'll take a look at that. Whispered me while I was in streaming. I can't see. Uh, you've been at a college fair, and now you're multitasking. Excellent. So this is my um, 5x objective. It doesn't have differential interference contrast, so I should probably pull out the. Uh, if I wanted to leave it on this, I want to pull out the actual DIC uh, filter but I'm probably not gonna leave it on that. I'm gonna move up at least to 10. Um, the 10 is a DIC objective. It shares the DIC with the 20X filter. And there's a bunch of ciliates, more ciliates than last night, or two nights or three nights ago, whenever I looked at this same sample because I've just been letting, letting it live in my on my uh, desktop here the last couple of days. Um, I don't have allergies, I probably have, well, I do get allergies sometimes, but I think this is actually a cold that Sylvia gave me, but uh, it's just giving me a little bit of a raspy throat at this point. And this is the 20X objective, so we are zoomed in a little bit, and let me fix the, I'm gonna fix the light quality for a second here. Let's see, I need to... That's probably good. I'm gonna get a nice clean view of that uh, ciliate. That's DIC. And you're looking at a, uh, I'm assuming it's some sort of paramecium based on the shape and where the ciliate are. Uh, there's another paramecium sort of worked its way in with like a golden color to it. You can see the cilia very easily around the outside edges.
This is DIC, yeah. It looks okay. It's suitable. Um, this is the end plan objectives, which are a little bit different than the ones that I normally use, which are the uh, Fluitar um, on my other on my other light microscope. Uh, the objectives are Fluitar, but they allow for face contrast, which I almost never use. So I just told them to give me these ones instead, and their resolution's a little bit better. Um, then my other objectives, the DIC is a little bit cleaner as a result, and uh, I've got the contrast way up, so I can turn down the contrast a little bit if you'd like, or I can actually crank it up so it almost looks like a uh, dark field. Um, that's super high contrast, and then I also could, uh, I've got the, um, the diaphragm cranked down as well. So it's giving you a lot of relief, which helps with the image um, looking like three-dimensional. So it looks super three-dimensional as a result of the DIC because I have the diaphragm clamped down, uh, which lets less light in, but, uh, but gives us more depth of field. Same way as on a camera, like f-stop basically. itself along on the glass on the cilia in the front, right? You can see it kind of crawling. Isn't that neat? It's gonna move around so we can't follow it that way. And they're like legs, but they're actually just little hairs. Um, these paramecium have really taken over the sample. Um, they were uncommon. Uh, on Saturday, I think I streamed from the light microscope. And I found a few of them in here, but now they're all over the place. Um, that's a uh, Cynodesmus. It's just being pushed around a little. But now the Paramecium are everywhere. Um, just everywhere I go in here now. So probably because it's been warm and they replicate when it's warmer. Um, let me, let's see what I wanna do. Not that, but um, I'm just going to zoom around a little bit and um, let's see, I'm going to turn this back to something a little more practical. Oh, there's the one that looks like it's maybe dividing. It looks like it's in its dividing phase. It's looks like it's undergoing cell division. jewels on them, almost. It's not quite come apart. <laughs> I guess they could be having sex, but I doubt it. I think they just, I think they just uh, go through binary vision, don't they? Uh, my favorite beverage is uh, chai tea, probably, with like a uh, really strong ginger. I should go get some. I've actually been streaming for quite a while. Um, is it you, Plodies? Is that who this is? I guess it could be. They could be having sex. I don't know. I'm not an expert in ciliates, that's for sure. This is a sample from my koi pond, and as I mentioned, it's been sort of sitting in my uh, on my desktop here for the last three, four days. Um, and you can tell 
the bacteria are having their way with the sample now because it's at a warmer temperature than it normally is and most of the plant material is decaying. So you can see inside of this Clodophora cells, that's just a whole bunch of bacterial activity. They're kind of going nuts in there, uh, eating away at the cellular material inside. Yeah, I like it. It's nice. Um, we could zoom into another level. I'm on, uh, right now what we're looking at is, uh, 20x. And, uh, that's not our maximum magnification for it by any means. Um, this has a 100x objective on it. Uh, but we can't really look at the 100x objective stuff very easily, but I could go up to 40. Especially now that we have glass between us and our sample. Let's see. I'm going to play with some settings. Try to get that image a little bit better. Let's see if we can figure out what this little guy is. Oh, it looks like a little synapse, doesn't it? That little thing in the background is like cryptomona, cryptomonas. It's a, um, a flagellated, uh, and it's two flagella. This thing looks like maybe a, a heliozoan. I'm not sure. Yeah, like amoeba. It does look like those are pseudopods of some type. So I'm guessing it's some kind of amoeba. It seems like it's crawling. <laughs> it's not COVID, I can promise. Uh, there's no COVID growing in my pond. Yeah. It's got it's pseudopods all the way out. It's just looking for food. That's a predator right there. Oops. Let's get him back in the middle. Yeah, it's looking for something to snack on. It's some kind of amoeba. <sighs> Pretty cool. Zillin, I think. So we're at uh, 400x. We're really zoomed in, and then my microscope, uh, uh, my camera's also three times magnification. So we're, um, you know, we're up in the thousand times magnification range with that image, but uh, just optical for part of it. Diatom, fragments of diatoms, and that is our rotifer. We've been looking at deloid rotifers. These are other types of rotifers right here. These ones are predators. Uh, they don't just sit in place and spin their corona like the ones that we saw before, the deloids. Um, These ones actually seek out food or detritus to eat. That's probably what they're munching on right there. Uh, yep, this is from my koi pond, from my backyard. So, Good news, everyone! Hey, Derek. Thank you for the follow. 
Um, I didn't have to go far for this one, which is nice. Um, looks like another type of rotifer right there. A big one. A little more active. And its tail, or its foot, has these two really long toes. But that's a rotifer, I think. There's both the rotifers, same type. And I don't know the type uh, before you ask. brightness a little bit though. Um, but the foot, the little toes that they have are basically a good clue that you're looking at a rotifer. Um, and I think because this has been sitting in the dark uh, in my, um, on my desk basically, uh, it's benefited the ciliates and the rotifers that are mostly munching on the phytoplankton and uh, paraphyton. And so they've um, increased quite a bit in concentration since when I last looked in the sample. That's pine pollen right there. Um, and these little tiny things you see swimming around are tiny balls you see swimming around actually have flagella. They're probably some sort of um, flagellated uh, nano. <laughs> um, well, uh, trade in your car and you can have this one for the low price of uh, $20,000. Um, you could probably buy one used for less than that. There's another one of these little amoeba. Heliozoic amoebas. Super small. I'm not sure what it's munching on there. Found something though. Let's see. I wanna I'm curious what that is. Good news, everyone. Hey, Jim James, thanks for the follow. You see some of those little uh, flagellated nano organisms right there. Uh, and you can see their flagella wiggling around. That's pretty cool. Super small. eating something. <laughs> Farnsworth scared you? Uh, I've become immune to him. Uh, I'm used to him. Got enough followers recently that it didn't startle me. Printed 3D. Like, 3D printing a microscope seems like it would be a challenge, especially the lens. Let's look around. Uh, oh, that's a big old rotifer. Trying to figure out if it should put out its uh, curb feelers here. Let's see. Uh, I want to showcase dark field for a second. That's actual dark field. Um, I need to take this analyzer plate out. And then this is dark field at 20x. So. We lose a lot of the um, resolution when you're looking at stuff in dark field. Um, probably at 20x, that's about as good as it's going to look in dark field. 
there's not a lot of depth of field at this um, focal height. So I need to zoom out to 10x. And there's a nice dark field view of... Um, is it a rotifer? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. If we don't have 20,000 for a microscope, are there decent, cheaper options? Um, as long as you don't want uh, differential interference contrast lighting, there's lots of cheaper uh, microscopes that you could use. Um, the only thing that separates basically the high-end microscopes from the lower-end microscopes in terms of cost is differential interference contrast lighting. Um, if you just want to look at things in dark field like this, um, there's lots of options. Anywhere from a couple hundred dollars or less to a couple thousand dollars will get you a good microscope. Um, the, the DIC is this other view type that we were using. Um, hang on, I'll switch it over. Sorry, the camera's making it very bright. It needs to adjust. This is DIC lighting, um, and it is spectacular. And uh, it makes the microscope much more expensive. So, yeah. Sorry about your retina. Um, you know, the difference in cost is whether or not you want DIC light. Um, but uh, you can get plenty of microscopes that don't use DIC that are cheaper. Um, for diatom work, it's kind of critical, or at least I've convinced myself and other people that it's critical. Uh, enough that they buy me these kinds of microscopes. Um, a lot of diatoms in the sample, but we, when I first uh, looked at this on Saturday or whatever, there were a lot of diatoms in here, so my guess is it's what everything's been eating um, in order to get all these extra ciliates. Good news, everyone! We have to, uh, something has to get eaten. So it's probably been mostly the chlorella and uh, the diatoms that have been consumed. There are some in here still. It's a little Good news, everyone! Right in the middle there. Thank you for the follows. The DIC is gorgeous. <laughs> you can just watch the stream from, for now anyway. Um, yeah. burst of people that came in super interested in it all of a sudden. Um, yeah, the DIC makes a big difference if you're, if you're trying to get a pretty picture at high resolution. So we can do that here. I can turn up the contrast so you can really see it. And make use of the DIC. So hopefully that looks pretty for you. I've got the contrast up and I've got the uh, the relief super high, so giving us a nice clear image with a very 3D sort of appearance to it. Good news, everyone! And that's why this is what separates your regular microscope from a high-end research-grade microscope is whether or not it has DIC optics. Uh, that was a paramecium of some type. Sort of a ciliate, sarcadenoid. No, ciliate. They're all over in here. I don't know my paramecium very well, but. If I could figure out the one that lives in my own uh, pond, that'd probably be a good start. They're all over, though. 
I think they've been eating my diatoms. The diatom that's in here, we've looked on uh, some of the diatoms that are in this pond are the same from year to year. And uh, we've looked at them on the SEM uh, from this, not from this sample, but from my pond. And there are a lot of gonfanema. What does gonfanema look like? This guy right here. Uh, sort of like little submarines. I think it's Gonfanema Johnson Eye. about what Gonfanema is. I think Johnson is on that web page. So uh, there was also a big old worm in the sample, uh, a different sample, but there might be some worms in here that got eaten. Uh, I saw some uh, a couple different types yesterday, or not yesterday, Saturday. There's one right there that's still alive. That's a nematode in the background. Kind of hard to pick out. Right there, you can see its head. Uh, look, I got an arrow now. It's this head right there. It's sort of body is speaking through the, um, the material right there. little universe. Um, Martin, you might want to... Yeah, an arrow. Martin, you might want to uh, uh, post up the stats for it, either in my Discord or... I know Pacific Plankton has a sort of a microscope-based channel um, where people have talked about different kinds of microscopes and... Um, you know, feel free to post it there or in Pacific Plankton's. Um, there's Discord for mine is right there. Pacific got it for you. Um, or you can click on Pacific's name and grab her Discord as well. Or um, she hangs out in my Discord and I hang out on hers quite a bit. So um, either way, you'll catch one of us probably. Um, and we periodically can give people advice on uh, choices for microscopes. It's hard to go wrong uh, if you're just trying to do bright field. Um, you know, the, um, the options and expenses, um, like if you want to spend 1500, um, <coughs> you might go, I think you can get a Prima Star, one of the versions of the Prima Star in that range, um, or a Leica in that range. Um, things to consider that are really important is whether or not you need a trinocular mount. So this is a trinocular mount. It's got a, um, a separate piece for the camera that comes up. And then there's a camera adapter. If you're going to try to stream from it, for example, or if you wanted to take pictures, not through the eyepiece, but uh, through somewhere else, um, you need to have a trinocular mount and a camera adapter to connect your camera to the actual microscope. Um, you can get by with uh, cameras that you can mount onto the eyepieces or you can even 3D print uh, like a, a iPhone holder or something that works just fine. Uh, what are the white dots that are wriggling around? Uh, in the background, those are... Um, flagellated nanoorganisms, probably some sort of a bacteria, uh, either uh, something in the monas group or it's a, cryptof a cryptophyte. I'd have to zoom in on it and I'd probably have to uh, spend a bit of time analyzing it, looking through my book uh, to try to figure out what it is, but um, there's a lot of them and every time I've zoomed in on them, they have flagella. So, um, sometimes you can see the flagella very clearly. Ooh, this is an interesting little guy. He's also crawling around a little bit. 
Uh, that's a ciliate. You can see the cilia kind of pulsing in the background there. <laughs> Talked to Bob when I discovered him streaming. Uh, this one's a trinocular version. The objections are infinity corrected end plan. Yeah, mine is end plan. Uh, that's what these ones are. So, um, they're pretty good. <laughs> I don't have the hair for Bob Ross, but, uh, I like his vibe. So you can see the little cilia fringe around the front end of it, and then also the sort of longer cilia in the back. They look like little spines, but I think they're hairs. Whoa, that one had some sort of like trailing hairs when it went really long trailing hairs. You see those? I don't know if it's just dragging something. I think maybe it's just dragging something. Oh, it's just got those little tiny hairs. I don't think those other parts are attached to it. I think that was just pulling them along. Yeah, I was dragging something. Yeah, there's something spinning inside there, inside its body. Uh, I can zoom in, but the quality of the image won't improve any. Um, I could also turn up the brightness a little bit and then uh, decrease our depth of focus. Sorry. Um, that might actually give us a little bit better insight into what's going on inside. Uh, it's not helping a lot here. fringe around the front and like spine like cilia in the back and then it has like longitudinal bands going across I have a book uh, for uh, freshwater protozoa and I probably could look this one up but uh, It looks like I already found it, maybe. Something like Aspidisca. I don't know. I flipped right open to something that looked like it. Well, I won't have to sanitize it because I'm the only one who uses this microscope, so it'll be fine. the using its rotor for its corona to actually pull itself along sometimes they'll do that they'll start to spin their little uh, ciliates cilias and it, it'll basically pull them forward like an airplane it's kind of cool it's like the game spore 
a little bit. I think rather the game spore is a little like it. See, it's how it came along first. Yeah. See, there's a bunch of those. Bunch of the ciliates. They've kind of taken over the sample. I don't see a whole lot else in here anymore. Uh, which I suppose is expected. Well, there was some cooler other cilia that I saw, ciliates that I saw in here uh, the other day. I probably can't handle the warmer temperatures, so... Like temperature's the most likely thing that's causing them an issue. Let's see if I can... Where'd that guy go? Oh, just a little bit off the screen every time I stop. I don't think I'm gonna catch him. Getting hot, yeah. Throw some of my eyebrow mites. Um, I've looked for eyebrow mites, as I mentioned earlier in the stream, without any luck. Um, I wouldn't be bothered by them in any way, but um, a number of times I've tried looking for them and I have not been able to find them. So either I do not have an uh, infestation of eyebrow mites, which is possible, or I've just been unlucky and every hair that I've looked at has not had them. But I've looked in several eyebrow and eyelash hairs in the light microscope and also on the SEM uh, without any luck. So I don't know what to tell you. I probably don't have any. Or I just haven't looked hard enough, one or the other. Okay. Uh, Yeah, I suppose it's symbiotic in a way. I don't mind them, but uh, I never find them, so. They are, uh, they don't like me apparently, unfortunately. So they would make for a lot of entertainment value, I think. To be able to pluck some out of my head and just put it on a microscope. up just a little bit and I'm going to try and fix it with the automatic. It's pretty good. So that's just a rotifer, um, kind of like the ones that we were seeing before. Um, it's attached with its foot and then that's its mast axis, basically its jaws you see moving on the inside. And at the top, the corona that it's spinning, um, and you can see particles being drawn towards its mouth, which are basically between those two uh, whirling, like, wheel structures, which are not really wheels. They hide in your ears during the day. Uh, I suppose it's possible. Um, I think they hide at the uh, root of your hairs during the day. today. Tomorrow I'm going to stream from the SEM from 1 until 3. You have a jungle up here. Well, maybe you've got some good resources. You should uh, take some samples and find out. Um, if you have a microscope or access to one. Good news everyone! Might be a good time to uh, give it a shot. Okay. Uh, it's like 11.20 here, and I did get a nice nap, but I feel like maybe I'm gonna stop streaming now. And we can raid somebody. And lots of uh, 
interesting targets. But if I stay along too much longer, then the people are gonna start raiding me. So I've gotta get out before people get in. Um, so let's um, let's go raid Paleontologizing. I think he's a good choice. I'll send you over to him right now. And um, I wanna say thanks for everybody for hanging out. This has been a fun little stream. Paleo Ontologizing. Let's see if I can spell correctly. Hey, I did. It's been a very nice chill stream. Um, first time with music that's actually functioning correctly. So um, that was, I think, a nice addition. And uh, I've had a nice evening. Two different samples. Um, I'll get ready to go get the uh, paleontologizing and see how he's doing. Um, I'm sure he's talking about dinosaurs or fossils of some type. And uh, he usually starts to cut out soon, so it's best if we get him before he starts to come at us with his hundreds of people. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be streaming from the SEM tomorrow. Um, I heard Line Wizard when he was here earlier said that uh, he was going to be streaming tomorrow night from his light microscope. I don't know what his samples will be, but uh, probably you should check him out. I think he said sometime around 9 at night. Um, other than that, uh, Pacific Plankton will be on on Thursday evening. Um, you should also uh, check out her. And we can um, send out a uh, shout out for Pacific Plankton. Thanks for joining this uh, stream. All right. We're going to go. Uh, we'll see you later. Have a good evening. Let's go get him.